Today we are going to discuss regression diagnostics. In the last video, I presented how regression is to be estimated by the method of ordinary least squares. Today I'm going to now I am going to discuss regression diagnostics. Whenever a regression equation is estimated, we must ensure that the data is in order, the estimates are proper, and only then can we rely on the estimates that we've obtained through the regression. Yeah. So the regression diagnostics. And what do we study in regression diagnostics? The finite or small sample properties of regression estimates. This, as I mentioned earlier, regression estimates are derived from a sample, which is a representative part of the population. And since the samples are small in relation to the population, uh, we have to be uh, aware of what are the finite or small sample properties of these estimates. Finite or small sample properties of the OLS estimator uh, that uh, uh, examines the statistical properties of the OLS estimator that are valid for any given sample size. The first is the assumption of linearity. The relationship between the independent variable, so the dependent variable, and the independent variables the regressors is linear, which implies that the marginal effects does not depend on the level of the regressors. So irrespective of what is the value of the x, y, the relationship is linear. It, it's it's uh, the same. The second uh, uh, finite or sam small sample property is the strict endogene exogeneity assumption. So what we mean is when you have a regression y is equal to a plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2 and so on and so forth, the x variable is deterministic. It's deterministic. It does not have any error. So you can completely control the independent. That's what's called the assumption of strict exogeneity. So what we mean is if you're talking of a regression with the output uh, of uh, rice and input of fertilizer, then the x variable fertilizer, the independent variable, is deterministic and is strictly exogenous. It doesn't depend on anything else. It is in your control. So amount of fertilizer, it depends on you. That in turn does not depend on something else like rainfall and so on and so forth. Now, this is very critical. Whenever a regression uh, equation is fitted by the method of ordinary least squares, there are four assumptions which underlie this estimate. estimate. The first is that the error term, the error term is the difference between the actual and the predicted, EI is normally distributed with mean zero and standard de and standard deviation sigma E. So it can be written as E, normally distributed in bracket zero and sigma E. The, the, this, this assumption is tested using the bruch pagan test among a host of other tests. And the solution of this problem is if this problem exists, if the data is not normal and is not constant variance, it is uh, the solution is weighted least squares, weighted least squares, and the problem is called heteroscedasticity. The second assumption is regarding the independent, uh, the independence of the independent variables, or the interdependence of the independent. The independent variable should not be inter interdependent and they should be independent. They should be independent, meaning that the covariance xi, xj, xi and xj being the independent variable should be zero, where i is not equal to zero. The problem is called multicollinearity. And the test that is used is called the variance inflation factor. And the solution to this problem is to drop the x values or the x variables which have a variance inflation factor value of greater than 8 or even lower if you are very precise about multicollinearity. The third assumption is this applies only to time series data. Time series data is data that is recorded at over a period of time. It is called a chronological order. So in time series data, the error terms are not serially dependent which can be expressed as covariance ET, ET minus 1 is equal to 0, which means that the, co the error terms are serially not correlated. 
So this is tested. The problem is called, if the problem exists, it's called autocorrelation. And the test that is used is called the Durbin Watson's test. The solution is to perform a Cochrane Orca transformation and then to make the estimate. And the last estimation is essentially theoretical and it states that the error term is not related to the independent variables. Not the dependent, but the dependent. The error term should not be dependent on the independent variables. It is uh, it's a concept which is theoretical and uh, the solution to this problem is to use, instead of OLS, to use simultaneous equation models. Simultaneous equation models. Now there is something called the asymptotic properties of OLS. By asymptotic properties of an estimator, we mean the properties that are true when the sample becomes larger. So let x1, x2, x3, x4 be a random sample from a distribution with parameter t, theta then theta hat will represent the maximum likelihood of uh, maximum likelihood estimator of theta. So this is what it means. It means what you estimate will be a true representative of what you are seeking to study, which is the parameter. Then the second property is an estimator is blue. Blue stands for best linear unbiased estimate. If the minimum variance the best linear unbiased estimator. So any estimator is blue only if it has the estimator has a minimum variance. To demonstrate this, we use to demonstrate this, we use the Gauss Markov theorem. To demonstrate this, we use the Gauss Markov theorem. In short, the OLS and MLE estimator satisfy the Gauss Markov theorem. In, but it's, uh, it is known that both the ordinary least squares and the maximum likely estimators satisfy the Gauss Markov theorem, and which implies that the estimates, uh, estimators are blue or best linear unbiased estimates. So, moving on to the asymptotic properties of the OLS, there is called a uh, there's a concept called consistency which is in other words unbiasedness an estimator of a given parameter is said to be consistent if it can if it convergence it's if its convergence in a probability to the true value of the of the parameter as the sample size tends to infinity so we said if you have an estimator which seeks to measure an estimate as the sample size increases the, the Estimator becomes closer and closer to the S, to the parameter. Estimate becomes closer and closer to the parameter. So this is called the concept of consistency. We now look at the properties of all estimators that hold in large samples, or more precisely, as the sample size n tends to infinity, keeping the number of exponentially variables k fixed. The idea is that at least for the model estimates using large data samples, their asymptotic results will provide a useful approximation to the behavior of our estimators and test statistics. The power of this approach is that we can establish useful asymptotic results under much weaker assumptions than those needed to show the OLS estimator is unbiased and efficient and the classical uh, uh, in the classical regression model when we state that the pols is consistent what we mean is the oldest estimator approximates a population parameter so this is a basic property of every it should be consistent it should be consistent which means the bias should be minimal a key assumption for the oldest estimator to be consistent is the error term ui is uncorrelated uh, or orthogonal to the explanatory variables in the uh, vector of independent variables, meaning that the error term, which is also on the right hand side, should not be correlated with the independent variables also on the right hand side. So this ensures that the estimate is unbiased. Consistency further requires that the variance of B falls as the sample size increases. SM, yep. Yeah. Can you spoken 
So they they told they will buy it for twenty each, and uh, they told uh, how much ever you have when it is because they have to go to the market and buy. It. So if it is from here, then they they need not spend the money to go spend it. So uh, he asked minimum they need forty to fifty. You have. There is he told that one you know, there will be more than fifty. So mm-hmm. doing will be a problem. So we will be doing how much ever. Like can you can bring somebody and do it. No, no. We are oh, okay, we don't waste it. Huh? Do we bring someone and do it? Ask someone to come and do it. Uh, then that, what, what difference does it make? No, what, 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 what will we get? That's okay. Ask somebody to. It's very tiring. Yeah. Yeah. Tedious it is. Yeah. Asymptotic now, no, no, normality. We start by considering a sufficient set of assumptions for the OLS estimator suitably scaled to have a limit distribution that is normal. So we have to test the significance of the regression coefficients. This has already been explained earlier. This is done through the ANOVA table. This is done through the ANOVA table, where we have the various components and the first test of the significance of regression is the f test so the f test signifies the overall significance of the regression equation the f test is calculated by dividing the means sum of squares of regression by means sum of squares of error and this we get the calculated f and this calculated f is tested against the data table f to determine whether it's significant So, to determine how, to what extent the independent variables in the regression explain the variation in the dependent variable, we calculate a statistic called the R squared, which is also referred to as a coefficient of multiple determination. The coefficient of multiple determination is calculated uh, from the ANOVA uh, as sums of squares due to regression divided by uh, sums of squares due to total, or it can also be calculated as 1 minus sums of squares of error divided by uh, sums of squares of total. There is another concept called the adjusted R squared. The adjusted R squared is a statistic uh, identifies if adding variables to the model are redundant or not and helps to check if including regressors, regressors that are not really useful. This is what the various assumptions look like. Heteroscedasticity. Heteroscedasticity is the assumption that states that the error term is normally distributed with mean zero and standard deviation sigma i. So when there is heteroscedasticity in the data, the the error terms tend to pan out or fan out like this. And if there's a plot of the independent the dependent variable on the independent variable on the independent variable should gives a figure like this. It's indicative of heteroscedasticity. So in statistics, heteroscedasticity happens when the standard error of the variable are non-constant. So what we assume is that the variation at every point of x is the same. Now you can see that the variation of every point in x is not the same. It is increasing or decreasing. Then you have a problem called heteroscedasticity which can either be determined by inspecting the errors or by doing a, a, a test of statistics, which is called the Bruce Peg and Goldfeld Coint, and a whole lot. So to detect heteroscedasticity, we use the Bruce Peg test. Bruce Peg or the Cook Weisberg test of heteroscedasticity. The Bruce Peg test is designed to detect any linear form of heteroscedasticity. You can run a regression and give the STAT, E STAT or H STAT command uh, in, in NHL. To rectify and to rectify you need to rebuild the model with more independent variables or transform the variables using a box cost transformation. A box cost transformation is a mathematical transformation of the variable to make it approximate to a normal distribution. Often doing box cost transformation of the y variable solves the issue.
or you could use weighted least squares a more difficult option but superior when you can make it work right so the use of weighted least squares is also a solution to the problem of heteroscedasticity and what are the consequences of heteroscedasticity heteroscedasticity does not result in biased parameter parameter estimates in addition the standard errors are biased when the heteroscedasticity when heteroscedasticity is present this in turn leads to bias in the test statistics and the confidence interval comes to multicollinearity multicollinearity can affect the regression model with more than one predictor it occurs when two or more predictor variables overlap so much in what they measure that their effects are indistinguishable one popular uh, one popular detection method is based on the bivariate correlation between the two independent variables for example if you are regressing um, uh, crop production and you have two variables uh, two variables irrigation irrigation and fertilizer use you will find that there is a very strong correlation between irrigation and fertilizer use thus uh, they tend to uh, overlap and you cannot distinguish their difference so this can be detected by doing a correlation calculation but multicollinearity is very problem like problematic in a regression as can, it can result in several problems the partial regression coefficient due to multicollinearity may not be estimated precisely so your regression coefficient itself could be biased the standard errors are also likely to be high so these are the two major consequences that one is you cannot detect the difference between the two if it's you cannot find out what is the contribution of irrigation and what is the contribution of fertilizer second thing is the coefficients itself will get biased and the standard errors will become very large multicollinearity results in the change in the sign as well as the magnitude of the partial regression coefficients but uh, for for one uh, from one sample to another so when you keep taking a different different samples you'll find that your values of the coefficient itself will change and the signs will also change so what is positive will end up to be negative and what is negative will end up to be positive multicollinearity makes it tedious to assess the relative importance of the independent variables in explaining the variations caused by the dependent variables so you cannot detect the importance of variables as some variables will tend to become non significant in the presence of high multicollinearity the confidence intervals of the coefficients tend to become very wide and the statistics tends to be very small uh, it becomes difficult to reject the null hypothesis and very often many variables will turn out to be <coughs> non significant this shall be detected <coughs> can be demonstrated multicollinearity can be detected with the help of the tolerance and its reciprocal called the variance inflection factor so you can either use tolerance direct uh, di uh, tolerance low values of tolerance are desirable uh, are, are undesirable and higher values of vif are undesirable so one is the reciprocal of the other so if the value of tolerance is less than 0.2 or 0.1 and simultaneously if the value of vif is greater than 8 or 10 then multicollinearity is problematic and hence uh, one of the variables which is having the problem multicollinearity should be should be deleted the third problem that we encountered was a problem of autocorrelation autocorrelation is a characteristic of data which shows the degree of similarity between the values of the same variable over successive time intervals autocorrelation is diagnosed using the uh, the correlelogram <coughs> and can be tested using the durbin watson test so the durbin watson test is useful for testing the hypothesis of a lack of first order autocorrelation in the disturbed stuff so the problem is actually with the error term since the data is time series the error term of one period should not be correlated with the in previous period it need not be the the immediate preceding it could be 2 2.2 uh, lag or 3 lag preceding the current value the Co cochrane orcut procedure is used to correct it um, since uh, two successive applications of ols are involved so it it, can, it, it is also called a two step procedure so first you calculate the autocorrelation of the error terms rho which is also called the autocorrelation coefficient and then we you carry a carry out a transformation of the data where you subtract the 
current value of the variable from the when you know you can subtract the, the, the previous value of the variable multiplied by the auto correlation quotient from the current value of the variable as is shown over here. So the previous value is subtracted from the current value. Similarly, for the independent variables. So the previous value uh, is subtracted from the current value. So x t minus 1 is considered to be. So do this transformation again carry out in OLS, check for, for check for autocorrelation, uh, that do the Durbin Watson statistics and if the problem is re rectified then you stop. Otherwise again you perform this on the on the difference. Till autocorrelation then these coefficients are interpreted not the original coefficients. Then of course misspecification bias is one thing that is theoretically decided and misspecification is bias is when the independent variables are strictly not exogenous and we discussed earlier that when independent variables are strictly not ex exogenous the coefficients become biased. For example, uh, when you say that uh, 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 when you are studying the degree gross national product of the country and you use uh, um, index of industrial production as an independent variable, the index of Indian uh, industrial production is not strictly exogenous. The industrial index of industrial production depends on GDP, it depends on the employment rate, it depends on uh, foreign direct investment, so on and so forth. So you know that it's not strictly independent. It's not strictly independent and hence in such cases when, when, when it is known a priori that the independent variable is not exogenous then the best thing would be to uh, use a simultaneous equation model where you specify the entire system of equations before they are estimated. What are the major problems in in, uh, in is outlier detection? Usually, the influence 